Good morning, good day, good evening, good night, or whenever you're listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Gods of this world, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I realize it's been a little while since I have turned out a Bible study or a Bible lecture, but I have had a bunch of events going on in my personal life, and uh, I have been busy working and trying to promote my book, The Iconic Time Box, and trying to release the sequel to The Iconic Time Box called um, The Quest for Pandora 5. So life got real busy real fast and things kind of got out of control so I haven't had as much time and hopefully pretty soon I'm going to be able to rectify that and get back to teaching our Father's Word uh, on a more weekly basis or as soon as I can turn the lectures out anyway. But today again we're going to be talking about the gods of this world. Even from the beginning of the Word of God we have read of how Satan deceived Eve by offering her something he had no real power to give. All Satan actually did was to convince Eve and by extension Adam to disobey God in order that they might please their own fleshly desires or their desires to be something more than they were. This is the way Satan works. This is his method of opera, uh, operation, his modus operandi. Satan always offers things which we could call Satan's bargains to all who will give him ear. And sadly nowadays in the world there are many who seem to be of the same mindset as Satan and they offer mankind lies and deceit and push for things which God has forbidden and make promises of bigger and better and something for nothing. In essence they propagate the idea that God and his word are of no importance while they bend over backwards to please the wiles of mankind's fleshly desires. Today we see men in grand positions of power offering mankind everything they want, giving them handouts, entitlements, status, and all that they give is given as bribes for votes so that they can attain to more power and more control. Indeed, even the very freedoms that we enjoy are being taken away from us in barter for the promises that they give of bigger and better and more things for free. Yet their promises are as hollow and as empty as a paper bag filled with air. Even so, people are still lining up to sell away their liberties and moreover their souls for the promise of something for nothing. In the Old Testament, we are given the history of the Promised Land and the children of Israel. We are shown literally how God feels about men worshiping things made of men's hands and calling those things God. And in reading these things, in turn, we learn by example through metaphor that a God can be anything that is put before God the Father and our Creator. In other words, anything that is put before God Almighty becomes a God to man. Because that is what they bow down to in, in a manner of speaking. In other words, it's what they devote all their time to. It doesn't matter whether it's their job or wealth or power or uh, any number of things. Anything that you put before God becomes your God. There are so many things in the world today which people do put before God, including their own flesh or the lust of their flesh. 
We now have so-called National Pride Month where people celebrate what they call diversity or equality. Only their diversity and their equality are really just cloak words for out and out open ungodly perversion. You know, we've give, been given examples of this before. In other words, things like abortion going on today in the world. What was happening at the time when Moses was born? Well, the ruling king at the time of Moses, which was Pharaoh of Egypt, demanded the death of the male children of Israel. Why? He wanted to stop this so-called uh, Redeemer that was coming. And in like manner, when Christ was born, the ruling king of that time demanded the death of all the male children. In other words, Herod. Today, politicians demand the death of unborn children and call it the right to choose. And when I say demand it, it's not that they go out and chant, let's kill all the unborn children, but in their laws, in their lobbying, in their advocacy, they push for the death of the unborn. It puts me in mind of something I saw once uh, recently at a local lake. And this is part of nature and just the way it is. But a mother duck had a bunch of baby ducklings following her around. And in an instant, a tall bird, which usually waited peacefully at the edge of the lake, sprang upon the baby ducks and grabbed one of the baby ducks up and took the little bird off and proceeded to kill it and eat it. Now, some of our politicians today, while they do not per se eat the unborn children, they do lobby and per fight to preserve a skewed law which allows doctors to kill the unborn. In doing so, that they, they are showing us that they are no better than an ignorant predator bird which kills and eats newborn fellow waterfowl because it is its brute beast instinct to do so. Only while the bird is innocent of any sin in doing what it does, the politicians who preach this chaos and shedding of blood are most certainly not. But then again, they also preach many things that are against our Father's Word. Homosexuality, lesbianism, transgenderism, in some cases now even pedophilia. And they do this as they seek votes so they can grasp ever more power, so that they can have ever more possessions. In other words, they seek after earthly wealth and fame. Some of them are even worshippers of false deities. In other words, they're Satanists or Luciferians. Others follow the more secular uh, view of religion. And all of them continually convolute history. They're continually rewriting history and erasing parts of history. They seem blissfully unaware that these things they are doing and these things that they are following and bowing down to are likened to the gods of the Old Testament. In other words, the gods of this world. Things made of man's hands. Because they can sift it consistently lift these things up above God Almighty in His Word and His law. As surely as Satan, in his pride, raised himself up to try and overthrow God. The people of this modern generation, which is to say the fig tree generation, are raising their perverse toxon rainbow flags and waving them in the very face of God in their pride. And many of them are convinced in their blind stupidity that God is even likened to one of them and burns with their same fleshly desires. In other words, they make the God who created them and is able to kill their very souls out to be a pervert likened to them when they claim that God wants people to practice perverse alternative lifestyles, which he himself, in his very word, told us to avoid and not to do because they are abomination and filth. 
Is it any wonder the world is in such a foul state? Our politicians are supposed to be leaders and knowledgeable men and women of understanding. Yet they show that they are anything but when they bow themselves to the perversion of this world for gain, for power, for votes. As mentioned, they have given their blessing to the murder of the unborn, while at the same time stymieing all attempts for justice to be served. When it comes time to rid the world of murderers. In other words, they lobby to kill the unborn and they lobby to save those who have committed murder. They're hypocrites. They perpetuate open myths such as evolution or climate change or that little boys and little girls are neither male nor female until they are old enough to decide for themselves. But even so, they try to convince us that a child of five years old is already sexual enough to know whether they're going to be gay, straight, uh, or, or male or female. And not only this, they present the ignorant ideology that socialism is the answer to all the world's ills and problems. That socialism will bring a fair and prosperous and affordable future despite what history has shown us about socialism. That it has destroyed countries. That it has brought down nations. And it has caused the people who have lived under it to flee to other nations. And the sad part is, despite the fact that they showed us their super colossal bombastic ignorance, they still have supporters who keep voting for them election cycle after election cycle. Simply because they don't want to break with party lines. Because party lines and fleshly desires are much more important than the Word of God, at least to them. Yes, my friends, brothers and sisters, this is that corrupt generation God told us of in prophecy and has given us examples of all throughout his word. Mankind is blind and willing to appease or placate anyone who will vote for them or give them more power. Therefore, perversion like Sodom and Gomorrah is running rampant in our streets. Children marching in gay pride parades, waving their little rainbow flags, unaware of what they're even celebrating. And few seem to abhor these things, and even fewer seem to be willing to speak out about it. No, rather they tolerate it, or they embrace it, for fear of being labeled as intolerant, or as bigoted, or any number of unsavory labels and as they tolerate it embrace it it becomes commonplace it becomes the new normal though it is not normal and never has been normal and as perverse as ever it was these who lobby and advocate and preach this show that they have no fear of God nor reverence for God, nor do they care of His Word, but rather they are respecters of men's personage. And panderers who place the lusts of the flesh above the glory of Almighty God. And this is a cycle which keeps repeating itself. Men and women now rise to power on lies and deceit and hands out and promises. Promises of bigger and better. Promises of freebies. And they push socialism and they push these perverse things and they don't even bother to hide it. In ages past they would have hidden these things. In ages past, that is if history was taught the way it should be, People would see that men like this brought war and destruction and left a wake of desolation. 
Yet, even though these things are recorded as history, within a generation or two, everyone forgot the bloodshed. Everyone forgot the torture. Everyone forgot the oppression. Everyone forgot the open bias and inequality that was done and dove right back into the same snare and celebrated as though it was something wonderful and to be revered. And I'm speaking, of course, of communism, socialism, sexual deviance, woefully unfair treatment of peoples and injustice, the raping of justice, quite frankly, which are now being embraced and have been being em embraced by a counterculture of skulls full of numbed brain cells, which place the flesh before God and have no consideration for the want or the will of God who created them, in part because they haven't learned God or they don't believe in God. No, rather they would rather be respecters of persons and perverse lifestyles. They are liberty haters and politicians who are partial to the ungodly. And they are raised up to power for favors and for bribes. And as mentioned before, they no longer even bother to hide their agenda. They're out in the open now. They're either too blind or ignorant to see it. It is my belief that most of the souls which stood against God at the Catabol or uh, in the earth age that was have been and are now being born into this current earth age. And like as they were there, in other words, rebellious, so they are here in this earth age. They're rebellious and they're lovers of the things which God hates. They're lovers of the flesh. They are brute beasts. This is how people like Nancy Pelosi or Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez or Hillary Clinton or Charles Schumer or Harry Reid or Maxine Waters or many, many, many others come to their power. And if you think they govern well, just look at the states where they came from. Look at the big cities in the states where they come from. They are bastions of crime and perversion. But then again, on the other side of the aisle, what do we have? Well, amongst the so-called conservatives, quote-unquote, there is silence and toleration and acceptance for fear of speaking out and offending potential voters if they do speak out. In short, the whole earth is being turned upside down. Right is being made out to be wrong. Wrong is being made out to be right. Injustice is ruling the day. Yet, this is what must come to pass. You see, you cannot have a new world order without first ridding the world of the old order. All that was right and good is now being turned backwards. Righteous judgment has failed as people lobby and advocate for their own bondage and for the wrath of God to overtake them. Yet, they say, we are tolerant. We are morally superior. Some even think themselves morally superior to God. They claim they are only fighting for freedom when in fact, they are destroying freedom with every action, every law, and virtually everything they support. And for those who do not support their brand of equality and tolerance and so-called freedom, they spew venom and hateful words, which convince the young, easily swayed, and the weak-minded that they in fact are right. 
These things would not have been tolerated 50 years ago or even 40 years ago. But you see, that's how these people operate. Slow and methodically. An inch at a time, but eventually an inch becomes a foot, and a foot becomes a yard, and a yard eventually, when laid down enough of them, becomes a mile. Again, they make things which are perverse the new normal. But it's no less perverse than it's ever been. And God is just as filled with anger and righteous indignation about these things as he has ever been. And one day they will come to regret it. We're going to be talking about this today as we go into some Bible study here. Be turning, if you will, to Exodus chapter 23. The book of Exodus chapter 23. The second book of Moses. And before we begin the Bible study portion of this little talk, this study, let us go before our Father's throne and let us ask God Almighty, who created our very souls for wisdom and understanding as we undertake this to study of His Word. So let us pray and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, glory unto Thy most holy name, Father. We come before You this day to ask You, O Heavenly Father, Creator of the universe and all that is therein, for wisdom and guidance and understanding of these your most holy scriptures father we ask you to open eyes and ears and hearts and minds to these truths father we ask you to lead us and guide us to shine the light for us to follow that we may not fall off to deception as so many in the world do and we ask these things of you father in the name of our lord and savior jesus christ yahushua hamashiach amen so, Exodus chapter 23, again, this will be Moses, the prophet of God, the redeemer of the children of Israel in the Old Testament, who brought them out of bondage with the power of God, giving God's thoughts to the children of Israel about things that they should not do. So, Exodus chapter 23 and verse 1. Thou shalt not raise a false report. Put not thine hand with the wicked to be an unrighteous witness. This, of course, means do not bear false witness. But what do men do when they turn their backs to truth and forward agendas or lies which go wholly against the word of God as they practice their flesh-pleasing? Is that not raising a false report? Is that not bearing a false witness? Because they put all, perpetuate all of these myths and put before us. You know, they tell us what is normal. They think human beings are too stupid to think for themselves, and in large part, by and large, it seems like they are. But then again, they've been being dumbed down for generations by educators, by college professors, and in some cases by their friends. Verse 2 Thou shalt not follow a multitude to do evil, neither shalt thou speak in a cause to decline after many to rest judgment. That rest there is written that way on purpose. It's to wrestle with judgment. You see, multitudes often live by mob rules mentality. We see this a lot at the border. We see it every time there's a riot. When enough people get together and say, we are right, then they begin to throw stones and injure people and to live like animals. And that's exactly what you've got going on here. <clears throat> Though they are not the actual majority that they claim, in today's world, with the media garnering sympathy for their causes and highlighting them and putting them on a pedestal above everyone else, most people think they are the majority and the new normal. And because of that, the righteous are the ones who now have to take second seat 
to the perversion of this world. Verse 3. Neither shall thou take countenance uh, excuse me. Verse 3. Neither shall thou countenance a poor man in his cause. Okay, what does this mean? Now, we know that God loves the poor. Okay? We know that God loves the poor. So then what is this verse trying to tell us? Well, it's quite literally saying you're not going to help out a person who is poor by choice. In other words, the only way you can help out a person who is poor by choice is to let them suffer so that they get out and get employed or get out and find something to do where they can make their way. But what this means is you will not lend your help or support to a poor man who is attempting to get something for nothing. And that is exactly what our politicians are doing today. In other words, do not feel sorry for a lazy whiner. <laughs> Reparations, my ass. Verse 4. If thou meet thy enemy's ox, or his ass going astray, thou shalt surely bring it back to him again. In other words, if you have someone who is an enemy, and you see his animal get loose, then you will take it back to him. Why? What, what good does that do? Well, then the man might not be your enemy anymore, or the woman. They might not be your enemy anymore. This is doing what is right. It's when you see um, something that can be prevented, you do something about it rather than seething and hating your enemy so bad that you just let his ox or his ass get away. Verse 5. If thou see the ass of him that hateth thee lying under his burden, and thou wouldest forbear to help him, thou shalt surely help with him. In other words, if you see a person's donkey, that's what an ass here is, a burrow or what have you, lying under his burden, in other words, he's been too heavily burdened and he's trapped underneath or what have you, bogged down in the mud, you could say, and normally you would forbear to help him, you shall surely help with him. This is not talk the second hymn is not talking about the uh, the ass. It's talking about your neighbor that uh, that you hate or that you don't get along with. Again, this mends fences. This causes your neighbor that hates you to become a good neighbor that will watch out for you. Verse six: Thou shall not rest the judgment of thy poor in his cause. Okay, now this is the opposite of what we heard a while ago concerning the poor. This means do not deny justice or forbear to help the poor which are in righteous pursuit of help. In other words, who aren't looking for a handout. Who aren't looking for you to give them something for nothing. Verse 7. Keep thee afar, or keep thee far from a false matter. In other words, what's a false matter? It's a lie. And the innocent and righteous slay thou not, for I will not justify the wicked. Now this says the innocent slay not. Tell me, is a baby in their mother's womb innocent? Well, yes, they are. They're born innocent into this earth age. In other words, don't join in with those that are pushing a false matter. In other words, just because man has decided that it's a choice to uh, kill an unborn baby, that doesn't mean it's right. That doesn't mean it's not a sin. Verse 8. And thou shalt take no gift. The, a gift is a bribe. Okay? Thou shalt take no bribe. For the bribe, that is to say gift, bindeth the wise, and perverteth the words of the righteous. This is why the leftists in our nation will never admit they are wrong, even when confronted with their own words from yesteryear, which prove them to be hypocrites. In other words, they took a stance on a position years ago, and now they're the complete opposite of it. Why? Because it is politically correct to do so. And we see this over and over again on YouTube where 
politicians are caught up in their own words. People like Bill Clinton, Hillary Clinton, Harry Reid, Chuck Schumer, the same lot that we talked about, even Barack Obama, and so many others, and even on the conservative side of the aisle. People get up and say one thing one year, and then five years later, they figure everyone's forgotten about it, and they say something totally different. Because attitudes change, and they change with it. There is a reed shaken in the wind. Verse 9. Also thou shalt not oppress a stranger, for ye know the heart of a stranger, seeing ye were strangers in the heart of the land of Egypt. Now a lot of people would try to use this verse to, to justify the poor illegals coming from other countries trying to get into this country. The only problem is, this does not have anything to do with people crossing the border into the country. Are you supposed to be kind to a stranger? Yes, you're supposed to be kind to them. But that doesn't mean you allow them to overrun you and change your nation's language and disrespect the flag and bring crime and diseases and everything else with them. You know, we all too often hear about the poor Mexicans in any number of countries down south in South America where people are being driven away, Venezuela, Colombia, and Peru, and all of these other places where people have had their nations taken over by socialism, in large part, or by dictatorships using the power of socialism. And they have pushed the people to the side, and of course the people are running to get away from them. And they're coming here. But as they come here, they wave their flag. In other words, they don't come into this country and learn our language and obey our laws, but they come here and they are allowed to vote and they're given handouts and they're given entitlements all to buy their votes. And of course, they're going to vote for the party that kisses their ass. You know, I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. However, what this verse really means is Put no burden on a stranger in your land to make his life harder. Okay? That doesn't mean allow an influx of thousands of people to come across your borders illegally and bring in drugs and, like I said, come in here with diseases and everything else. You know, America has borders and walls for a reason. And that reason is, of course, to keep us safe from those who would come here, who do not know our laws, who do not understand our laws, who do not know our language, who will not learn our language. Yet we've got politicians who are willing to do them a pleasure and pander to them and kiss their asses in order to get votes. And many of them come here and do crime and get away with it scot-free. And we've seen it time and time and time again. Verse 10. And six years shall thou sow in thy land, and thou shalt gather the fruits thereof. Okay? There's a deeper spiritual connotation to this. Um, six, of course, being the uh, sixth trump when, when Satan appears. And, of course, the seventh is what we're going to learn in the next verse, is the sabbatical year. It means the year of rest. And Christ is our rest. He comes at the seventh trump. Verse 11. But the seventh year thou shalt let the land rest and lie still. This is what they call a sabbatical year. This is when you let the land rest, and people who practice crop rotation know what this means. It means to let the land rest so it could refurbish itself. That the poor of thy people may eat, and what they leave, the beasts of the field shall eat. In like manner thou shalt deal with thy vineyard and with thy olive yard. In other words, all facets of things that are grown, you let the land rest. Again, it's called a sabbatical year. Verse 12. Six days shall thy do thy work, and on the seventh thou shalt rest. Again, this is the Sabbath that thine ox and thine ass may rest, and the son of thy handmaid 
and stranger may be refreshed. In other words, everybody needs a day off to refresh themselves. This, of course, is speaking of the Sabbath. Verse 13. And in all things that I have said unto you, be circumspect. That means to, to be vigilant, to take notice of, to keep in your minds. And make no mention of the name of other gods. You see that's lowercase g? Neither let it be heard out of thy mouth. In other words, don't bless another god. Don't worship another god. And again, anything that you put before God Almighty, whether it's wealth, power, the lust of the flesh, or what have you, becomes a god to you. This comes down to flesh-pleasing perverse agenda. Or a form of government which is brutal and unfair. Or possessions and wealth and power. Now, does this mean if you have possessions, you're wicked? No. Everyone has possessions, but if you put the possessions before God, in other words, if you've got a brand new Corvette and you put that before God and you spend all your time waxing that Corvette and you don't take any time to read your father's word or understand his word, guess what? You're not going to have his blessings and you're probably going to fall and bow and worship the false one. <clears throat> Any of these things which are coveted become a God unto those who serve them. So if you covet homosexuality, which is against the word of God, then you're living in a delusion that is bad as those who lived in Sodom and Gomorrah. The same with lesbianism, transgenderism, pedophilia. The same with forms of government which are oppressive like communism and socialism. They're not the answer. People think, oh, democratic socialism is going to be different. No, socialism has but one goal, and that is communism. Socialism and communism remove the freedoms that man have. They remove the right to worship as you see fit. They take your money and give it to others. But we've all heard this before, haven't we? Verse 14. Three times thou shalt keep a feast unto me in the year. Verse 15. Thou shalt keep the feast of unleavened bread. Thou shalt eat unleavened bread seven days as I have commanded thee, in the time of the appointed of or in the time appointed of the month of Abib or Aviv. In other words, that's the first month. We're talking about the Passover there. For in it thou camest out of Egypt. And none shall appear before me empty. In other words, when you go before God, give him his portion. Don't show up in front of God empty-handed. And what is it that we give God today? What is God's portion that we give him today? His reverence. Our unrequited love. Verse 16. And the Feast of Harvest, which is the Feast of Weeks, the first fruits of thy labors which thou hast sown in the field, and the feast of the ingathering, which is in the end of the year, when thou hast gathered in thy labors out of the field. You know, these last two verses, which we have read concerning these feasts, concern our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yet they were written long before his birth, because Christ is our Passover. And Christ is the first fruit. The first fruit of the harvest and the ingathering. It means you are to keep these days. In other words, you will not only observe these days, but you will keep them holy. Holy unto God. Verse 17. Three times a year or excuse me, three times in the year, all thy males shall appear before the Lord. In other words, everyone would gather at Jerusalem in front of the uh, Holy of Holies and appear before the Lord. Verse 18. Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice with leavened bread. Okay, see what that said there? With leavened bread? You all know what the leaven of the scribes and Pharisees is, right? That's their untruth. The bread is supposed to be unleavened, which means untainted. It was the bread of haste. Neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. In other words, 
you eat it up. Christ was our sacrifice for one and all times. You, you, you don't tarry when it comes to eating up the truth of our Father's Word. Why? You need it to survive. Of course, these Old Testament laws are literals, and they are a foreshadowing, but you need to look at them metaphorically to be able to understand this. Verse 19. The first of thy firstfruits of thy land shalt thou bring to the house of the Lord thy God. Thou shalt not see the kid in his mother's milk. Okay? The firstfruits are not only the firstfruits of the land, but it's also the firstlings of the cattle or um, lambs that you have. But it says here in the, in the last part of that, thou shall not see, which means boil, a kid in his mother's milk. In other words, that would be very disrespectful. Uh, milk is for a child's n uh, nourishment. Even a, a, uh, a goat or a lamb. Its mother's milk is for its nourishment. You shall not cook him in what was made to nourish him. You know, that, that's just God's fairness and, and love for his animals. Verse 20. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee into the place which I have prepared. Uh, you, you know which angel we're talking about here? The angel of the Lord. You want to see? Verse 21. Beware of him and obey his voice. Provoke him not, for he will not pardon your transgressions. For in him, or, or excuse me, for my name is in him. Okay, well if God's name is in an angel, what would that be? The angel of the Lord. Verse 22. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice, and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy unto thine enemies, and an adversary unto thine adversaries. And this would include the Kenites, and or Satan, or the demons of this world, the locust army, or anything that would offend, anything that would stand against God and try to, and seek to do you harm. And when I say harm, I, not necessarily uh, physical harm, uh, in some cases maybe, but moreover, harm to your soul. Verse 23, For mine angel shall go before thee, and breathe thee unto the Amorites, and the Hittites, and the Perizzites, and the Canaanites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. Now, why would God cut all of these people off? Well, you know, so many people write me, and, and uh, I've heard it on other lectures where people are talking about how unfair and genocidal God is. Because he strokes the uh, backs of his little children Israel while he's wiping out other people. Well, let, let, let me clue you one thing. God is not capable of murder nor genocide. In other words, if God deems that a soul is to be put to death in hell, that's not murder. And if God deems that a people are to be wiped out, that also is not murder. To understand why God would deem it okay for people to be wiped out off the face of the earth, you have to understand the people. First of all, they're idolaters. Okay? That in itself is not such a big thing because most people today are idolaters. But people were also perverse. Okay? So now they're idolaters and they're perverse. They're murderers and they had inbred with the fallen angels. Many of these people had inbred with the fallen angels and they were filled with tons of Kenites which lived in the land. If you go to the book of Joshua, there were uh, Hivites that posed as, uh, or Kenites that posed as Hivites to deceive the tribes of Israel and enter into them. And we all know the story of the Jebusites, which were the unclean people that uh, lived in Jebus, which uh, is the name of Jerusalem before it was claimed by the Israelites. But it was God's chosen place, none the same. But what does God say? I will cut them off. Well, why would God cut them off? I mean, they're his children. He created them. Well, God put them down here in the flesh. And they chose to go against the will of God. They chose to do 
perverse things which go against the nature of human beings. They chose to worship false gods. They chose to do murder or torture. And they chose to inbreed with Nephilim, that is to say fallen angels. And for that, God destroyed them from before the children of Israel. Verse 24. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do after their works. But thou shalt utterly overthrow them, and quite break down their images. Now, I want you to equate this to today. Imagine what would happen in this world if people stood up against the leftists and against the neocons and got rid of them and shunted them out of office and put in fair judges and fair congressmen and fair senators. Let's read that again with that in mind. Thou shalt not bow down to their gods. Again, a god is anything that you put before God, whether it's homosexuality or whether it's pandering to a people, or whether it's pushing socialism, or whether it's any number of things, like the pursuit of power and wealth. Nor serve them. In other words, you're not going to serve them. You're not going to serve them or their gods. Nor do after their works. So, how many people today are running around waving their little rainbow flags? How many today are running around preaching communism or socialism? But what does God say? Rather, but thou shalt utterly overthrow them. In other words, throw their asses out of office and quite break down their images. Again, an image is a metaphor. It was in the Old Testament quite literally a false god that people fell in worship. But today, very few people still worship such gods. No, today people worship things of the flesh. Again, the LGBTQ Socialism, drugs, power, possessions, music. I mean, it can be any number of things which drag people away from the truth of our Father's Word and convince them to please their flesh. Verse 25, And ye shall serve the Lord your God, and he shall bless thy bread and thy water, and will take thy sickness away from the midst of thee. You know, there is so much written in that one verse. You shall serve the Lord God, and he shall bless thy bread. What bread is it that we live by? The word of God, the bread of life, and thy water, the living waters. And he will take thy sickness away from the midst of thee. In other words, he can heal your very soul. Just as easily as Christ healed the blind, or healed the deaf, or raised the dead. Verse 26, There shall nothing cast their young nor barren in thy land. The number of thy days I will fulfill. In other words, there shall be nothing, this means man nor beast, that shall cast away their young. And what is it to kill the unborn? Nor be barren. Okay, God tells us that we're not going to be barren. So if people are getting pregnant and, and are with child, and they're not supposed to cast them away. What, what is this abortion thing? In other words, you don't let these things happen in your land. And the number of your days, God will fulfill. The qualifier there is if you serve God and reference Him alone rather than to back these that push for abortion and all of these other perverse things which are offered by the left. Verse 27, I will send my fear before thee, and will destroy all the people to whom thou shalt come, and I will make all thine enemies turn their backs unto thee. In other words, running in fear away from you. But that's not what's happening today. No, now the asylum is being overtaken by the inmates. The idiots are running things. Verse 28, And I will send hornets before thee, which shall drive out the Hivite, the Canaanite, and the Hittite from before thee. In other words, God can use nature. You see, all of these people God did cast out from the Holy Land, the land of Canaan, which became called Palestine or Judea. 
because they were perverse. They were idolaters. They hid in bread with fallen angels. They killed and tortured and maimed. They did perverse things which God did not savor or appreciate, but rather that he hated. And they worshipped false gods as God. And in the end times, thus shall it be again. Verse 29. I will not drive them out from before ye in one year, lest the land become desolate, and the beast of the field multiply against thee. In other words, if he'd driven all the people out of the land, then the beasts of the field would have multiplied. This, it, a number of animals which were, uh, would have been uncontrollable. Foxes, and uh, no, no doubt many predatory animals, as well as cattle, oxen, uh, what have you that could have trampled people to death. A number of things. In other words, what God is saying is, I'm not going to do this all at once. And why, what was another reason that God didn't do this all at once? Because he expected the children of Israel to go and do as he instructed them. Yet he walked with them. Verse 30. By little and little I will drive them out from before thee, until thou be increased and inherit the land. You know, you know what, I'll come to that point next. Verse 31. And I will set thy browns from the Red Sea even unto the Sea of the Philistines, and from the desert unto the river. For I will deliver the inhabitants of the land into your hand, and thou shalt drive them out from before thee. Verse 32. Thou shalt make no covenant with them, nor with their gods, lowercase g. This means do not fall for their lies and worship the false things which they call God. And as I have said already so many times in this very lecture, anything you put before God becomes a God to you because you serve it and not God. You see, our Father's word says man shall not lie with man as woman. That is homosexuality. And we have so many people today. I mean, we've got a month in this nation now called Pride Month, which is celebrated in every state where children march alongside of floats with men mimicking sexual acts on each other and wearing large phallus costumes and large uh, vaginal costumes. And if you think that doesn't make God's very soul boil and that his wrath is not going to be full when he comes, you got another thing coming, friend. Verse 33. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. For if thou serve their gods, it will surely be a snare which is a trap unto thee. Now, I want you to think that over again in modern terms. Again, with politicians, senators, governors, uh, representatives, congressmen, what have you, that go against our Father's Word and preach socialism and communism, which are Satanists, which are Luciferians, which push anti-American agenda. In other words, bring in the illegals and do away with the money for Social Security and for our veterans and pander and kiss the butts of the homosexuals, the lesbians, the transgenders, and the pedophilias. Pedophiliacs. Let's read that verse again with that in mind. They shall not dwell in thy land, lest they make thee sin against me. You know, that's exactly what they're doing little children marching around with rainbow flags. For if thou serve their gods, and again, their gods are the things that they put before God, including their perverse fleshly lifestyles, it will surely be a snare unto thee. In other words, it's going to be a trap for you. 
Friends, one day in the not too distant future, there's going to be a false Christ coming. And he's going to deceive many. They're going to fall and worship him. Practically the whole world, save of God's elect. And then Christ is going to return. In great power and glory, but also in rage and anger. And he's going to separate the chaff from the wheat, brother, and you can bet on that. <clears throat> Let us turn over now to Deuteronomy chapter 11. Deuteronomy chapter 11, continuing with this same subject line, also the book of Moses. Deuteronomy chapter 11 and verse 1. Therefore thou shalt love the Lord thy God, and keep his charge, and his statutes, and his judgments, and his commandments, always, which means always. Never ending, you shall do this. Okay, what is God's commandment concerning homosexuality and lesbianism? What is God's commandment concerning murder? And killing the unborn is murder, despite what some call it as choice. Verse 2. And know ye this day, for I speak not with your children, which have, which have not known, and which have not seen the chastisement of the Lord your God, his greatness, his mighty hand, and his outstretched arm. Or his stretched out arm. Verse 3. And his miracles and his acts, which he did in the midst of Egypt unto Pharaoh the king of Egypt, and unto all his land. Pharaoh, of course, being a type of the Antichrist, as was the king of Assyria and the king of Babylon. Verse 4. And what he did unto the army of Egypt, unto their horses, unto their chariots, how he made the water of the Red Sea overflow them as they pursued after you, and how the Lord hath destroyed them unto this day. You know, if you go to the book of Revelation, the sea is symbolic of the people. And the sea overflowing the chariots of Pharaoh's army is symbolic of the Antichrist locust army overflowing in the sea of people. And all of them are going to die for it, save they turn to our Father, which is one reason why God gave us the millennium, because God doesn't want any to perish. Unfortunately, some still will. Verse 5. And what he did unto you in the wilderness until you came unto this place. In other words, God's chastisement of this hard-headed, stiff-necked people. Verse 6. And what he did unto Dathan and Abiram, the sons of Eliab, the sons of, or the son of Reuben, how the earth opened her mouth and swallowed them up in their households and their tents and all the substance that was in their possession. In the midst of all Israel. In other words, all Israel witnessed the earth swallow them up. It was a type of hell in the pit. Verse 7. But your eyes have seen all the great acts of the Lord which he did. Verse 8. Therefore ye shall keep all the commandments which I command you this day, that ye may be strong. And go in and possess the land, whither you go to possess it. How you doing, friend? Do you possess your land or does someone else? Do you have liberty in this country, which was founded on freedoms? Or do you see freedom, freedom fading away as mankind turns their back on God and does things that 50 years ago, 40 years ago, would have been seen as pure perversion. I mean, were there homosexuals all those years ago? Of course there were. But they stayed in the closet in those days. And people weren't transgender in those days. Oh, they may have done so they may have been uh, they may have been uh, transvestites, but there was no transgenderism in those days. All of these things are latter day things which are created by men just as gods are hewn from stone and covered over with metal by the hands of men. Verse 9. And that you may prolong your days in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give unto them and to their seed. A land that floweth with milk and honey. It was God's promise. Verse 10. For the land whither thou goest 
to possess it is not as the land of Egypt from whence he came out, where thou sowest thy seed, and waterest with thy foot, as a garden of herbs. In other words, everything was growing in abundance in the Holy Land. You didn't have to plant the seeds there. And you didn't have to take water by foot and pour it onto the plants there. Why? Because it was watered by the former and the latter rain and by the dew of the morning. Why? It's God's favorite place on earth. But that extends into many great nations nowadays with the migrations of the children of Israel. Verse 11. But the land whither ye go to, to possess it is a land of hills and valleys and drinketh water of the rain of heaven. In other words, that's, that's the blessings from God. Verse 12. A land which the Lord thy God careth for, and the eyes of the Lord thy God are always upon it, from the beginning of the year even unto the end of the year. Verse 13. And it shall come to pass, if ye hearken diligently, that means if you listen closely unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord your God and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. Verse 14. That I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, thy wine, and thine oil. Again, there's a spiritual connotation to this. The living waters and plenty to eat. In other words, to feed your soul. The truth to feed your soul. Verse 15. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, that thou mayest eat and be full. Verse 16. Take heed to yourselves, that your heart be not deceived, and that ye turn aside and serve other gods, and worship them. Now remember, I'm going to keep saying this because repetitive speech is one of the greatest ways for people to learn. Anything that is put before God becomes a God. I don't care if it's your homosexual alternative lifestyle, your lesbian alternative lifestyle, your uh, pedophilia lifestyle, your transgender lifestyle, your socialism lifestyle, your socialist agenda, your communist agenda, or whether you're a Luciferian, or a Satanist, or whether you worship some of the other gods of this world. Eastern mysticism, or Wicca, or, or, or whatever. Or whether you just seek after possessions, or money, or wealth, or power. Or whether it's fleshly, whether it's sexual, it doesn't matter. All these things become a god to you when you spend all of your time chasing after them, and serving them, and not God. A servant cannot serve two masters. You have to bridle your flesh or be a victim of it. Verse 17. And when the Lord's wrath be kindled against you and he shut up the heaven that there be no rain and that the land yield not her fruit lest ye perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you Verse 18, Therefore ye shall lay up these, my words, in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, that they may be, on the, uh, be as the frontlets between your eyes. Okay? You know, we see this terminology all throughout the Bible. You've got the hand in between your eyes. What's between your eyes? Well, you could say your nose, but really this is talking about your forehead. This is where you receive the mark of the beast, or, quite frankly, the mark of the flesh, which is tantamount to the mark of the beast, or you receive the seal of God. In other words, when these things come upon you, then bind these things up in your heart and in your soul, and bind them to you for a sign upon your hand. In other words, learn and know the truth. Study your Father's Word and know His promises. And know what pisses Him off and what is going to earn you His wrath. Verse 19. And ye shall teach them 
your children, uh, and, and ye shall teach them your children, speaking of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. In other words, teach your children reverence for God. Teach your children the right things. Because, see, that's what has happened in the last, let's say, ten generations. People have moved away from God so far till this country now has a large secular population or a large population which esteem God lightly at the very best. Though they may go to churches, they learn false doctrines. Or they don't believe the Word of God. They're just going to church to make sure that they don't go to hell. They've got that much faith in Christ and in God. They think singing hymns and rolling around flopping on the floor like a fish is the answer. Or doing any number of other th idiotic things like dancing with snakes and drinking poison. Verse 20. And thou shalt write them upon the doorposts of thine house and upon thy gates. You know, this is the way it should be. The Ten Commandments should be listed or posted at every courthouse and the true meaning of them. But moreover here, what is the doorpost of your house, which is to say your temple? Well, it's your body and it's your mind. And upon thy gates, in other words, where you come in and go out, the, the, you know, we, there was such a book once called The Vulgate. And it had to do with the mouth, uttering the word of God. It comes from the word of volcano and, and the, the word gate. Verse 21. That your days may be multiplied, and the days of your children, in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give to them, as the days of heaven upon the earth. In other words, if you keep God's commandments and you do what he said, verse 22, for if you shall diligently keep all these commandments which I commanded you to do them and to love the Lord your God and walk in his ways and to cleave unto him instead of perverse alternative lifestyles or socialistic, communistic, godless, atheistic, scientific lifestyles, Verse 23, Then the Lord will drive out all these nations from before you, and ye shall possess greater nations and mightier than yourselves. In other words, when the children of Israel entered into the promised land, they were a small people against a lot of these nations. And, you know, I want you to think about the Europeans that came over here to America and conquered Canada and uh, the uh, American Indian which is to say the, the Native Americans, and uh, the, the colonies in Africa and Australia and places like that, everywhere the children of Israel have migrated to. You see, history has been convoluted to us to make everyone out to be a victim but the Christian, white, Protestant, Anglo-Saxon American. And I am not a uh, white supremacist. I don't preach that kind of identity. I don't respect that because I know that God created and loves all of his children and that the word is for all of his children. But pictures are painted for us of a history which is somewhat true but mostly false. And it's false in the agenda that it pushes. It's false for the lies that have crept in to what was real history. And I could name a bunch of things, but in order to keep up the time, I'm going to keep going with this. But I will say that what God said to the children of Israel, God kept his word. It was not God that breached his word with man, but man that breached his word or his contract with God. And because of that, our world is turned upside down and our freedoms 
are eroding away from within. Not from without, from within. Verse 24, to continue with the uh, chapter. Every place whereon thou the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. Now, who is God talking to there? Israel. Every place wherein the soles of your feet shall tread shall be yours. From the wilderness of Lebanon, from the river, from the river Euphrates, even unto the uttermost sea shall your coasts be, or your coast be. Now again, we're talking of the Holy Land here historically, but the children of Israel would eventually cross many of these seas and come to other nations. And they sat their soul of their feet on those lands, and those lands became theirs. Now, I'm not saying that they did it in the most wonderful way, but the people, the Gentiles, were driven away. And some of it, indeed, was unfair. But you've got to realize that the Kenites were also amongst them. I'm not saying that what was done to the American Indian or to certain other peoples, African Americans, and slavery was right. But think about if those things had never happened. How many people would there be saved more than now? Or, or would there even be as many? You see, you have to look at the end result. And you have to realize the truth that people today will use any argument they can use to try to convolute history into something it was not. Saying that people were killed off in genocide when if you look at the very history of the people, they were killing each other off. That includes African Americans. That includes the American Indians. You know, we're painted a picture that American Indians were simply just like in Dances with Wolves. They were all peaceful and friendly and smoked peace pipes and sat around singing songs and dancing around fires and eating and drinking and being merry. When in fact, they were conquerors. They would send out troops. And I say troops. Uh, you could call them tribal warriors if you wish. To scout out lands of their rival tribes. And they would go into those places and they would kill all the males, save of the children, and they would take the women and rape them. And they would kill off those tribes or either integrate those tribes into their collective and they would become the tribe. And that happened time and time again in American history. It happened also in African history. So, you know, p people tend to feel it's okay and fair to judge the evil, mean, nasty white race. But the truth is that every man that dwells in the flesh sins. And every man that dwells in the flesh, if they have not the word of God, will go out and kill and conquer. And even if they do have the word of God, they may kill and conquer. But it's not in the name of God uh, for the most part. I mean, if you look at things like I've mentioned before thousands of times in these lectures, the Spanish Inquisition, you know, the Salem witch hunts, all of these evil things which were done in the name of religion. But what was the religion? I mean, was that the word of God? Did God say to go boil people alive or to torture them or to make them confess under torture and then kill them? No, I don't recall reading that anywhere in the Bible. But you see, the Kenites have had a strong power base in religion and in many other things. Anyway, let's continue on. Verse 25. There shall be no man able to stand before you. For the Lord your God shall lay the fear of you and the dread of you upon all the land that ye shall tread upon. As he has said unto you. Now, again, this is concerning the Holy Land, the land of formerly known as the land of Canaan, which would become Judea, and is now called Palestine, Israel, uh, what have you. But this also extends to the Americas. It also extends to Australia, 
to the African colonies, to anywhere where the Israelite children sat their foot, wherever they became a stronghold. Verse 26. Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse. Verse 27. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Verse 28. And a curse if you will not obey the commandments of the Lord your God. And turn aside out of the way which I command you this day to go after other gods which ye have not known. You know, it was not until the generation of my birth that homosexuality came out of the closet. That lesbianism became so prevalent. That transgenderism was born. That pedophilia became a thing. And guess what? I was born in the generation of the fig tree. That rebellious generation. And you know what? There's only a few verses left, but I, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there at verse 28. Because it basically says it all. It basically says it all. I think there's four more verses, but uh, I'm going to go on to the next uh, chapter. Let's turn over to Zephaniah chapter 2, because I, I've made the point I wanted to make. So, Zephaniah chapter 2. Again, Zephaniah chapter 2, prophet of God, giving the word of God here. So, verse 1 of Zephaniah chapter 2. Gather yourselves together, yea, gather together, O nation not desired. Why not desired? Well, because they've turned their back on God. Verse 2. Before the decree, bring forth. Before the day pass as the chaff. Before the fierce anger of the Lord come upon you. Before the day of the Lord's anger come upon you. Verse 3. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Seek righteousness. Seek meekness. It may be ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. In other words, what is this saying? Seek ye the Lord. Read his word. Understand his word. All ye meek of the earth. Meek means lowly. In other words, you put others first. You don't raise yourself up in pride as Satan did. You don't stand up in front of cheering crowds and make wonderful long speeches saying how wonderful the glory of the LGBTQ flag is. You don't speak of socialism because you're a dumb, ignorant young child with a child's mind trying to pass it off as something wonderful, never worrying about what it's going to cost. Seek ye the Lord, all ye meek of the earth, which have wrought his judgment. Wrought means you have worked for his judgment. Seek righteousness. Okay, there is only one righteousness. There aren't two righteousnesses. Okay, if someone says it's wrong to abort an unborn child, that is righteous. If someone says it's a choice to do it, in other words, a choice to commit wanton murder, that's not righteousness, even though they call it righteousness. Seek meekness. In other words, seek that ye be lowly. Now, this doesn't mean you can't work and better yourself with God's blessings. It has nothing to do with that. But it means know your place, that God is above you. It may be that ye shall be hid in the day of the Lord's anger. In other words, hid from his wrath. And you will be. Verse 4. For Gaza shall be forsaken, and Ashkelon a desolation. They shall drive out Ashdod at noonday, and Ekron shall be rooted up. Now again, these places were all ungodly. Verse 5. Woe unto the inhabitants of the seacoast, and the nation of the Cherethites. The word of the Lord is against you, O Canaan, the land of the Philistines. I will even destroy thee, and there shall be no inhabitant. In other words, if you think God is happy with Gentile races that worship false gods or other religions, you're sorely misled. Verse 6. And the seacoast shall be dwellings, and cottages for shepherds, and folds for flocks. In other words, once the God has removed the people from off the land. Verse 7. 
and the coast shall be for the remnant of the house of Judah. Not the, not the false Jews, but Judah. They shall feed thereupon in the houses of Ashkelon. They shall lie down in the evening. For the Lord their God shall visit them and turn away their captivity. You know, that, that is why Christ came, to turn away our captivity from the wiles of this fleshly world and from the God of this world. The God of this world is Satan. Now, why do I say he's the God of this world? When, obviously, God created this earth. Because Satan is the God of this fleshly world. Satan is the one who offers these bargains, and those of like mind also promise many things which they can never deliver. And they're hypocrites. Verse 8. I have heard the reproach of Moab and the revilings of the children of Ammon, whereby they have reproached my people and magnified themselves against their border. Now, again, this was historical, but Moab means of his father. You've got your Kenite uh, uh, connotation there, along with Ammon. You have to look past the children of Lot in the flesh to see these things. In other words, even though Lot's children were Adamic, they were still Gentiles that magnified themselves against Israel, God's chosen people. Verse 9, Therefore as I live, saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab shall be as Sodom, and the children of Ammon as Gomorrah, even the breeding of nettles and salt pits, a perpetual desolation, the residue of my people shall spoil them, and the remnant of my people shall possess them. Now, that's the way it should be. But no, not in today's world where people turn their backs on God. Verse 10. This they, sh they shall have for their pride. Pride month. Because they have reproached and magnified themselves against the people of the Lord of hosts. You know, if you're a Christian in this world, you know exactly what is going on. Christians are being persecuted. Our laws are being changed to put down Christianity and to raise up all of these things which destroy souls. Verse 11. The Lord will be terrible unto them, for he will famish all the gods of the earth, and men shall worship him. Everyone from his place, even all the isles of the heathen, that is to say the Gentiles. Verse 12. Ye Ethiopians also shall be slain by my sword. Why? They were a Gentile people. Gentile, of course, today means unlearned. We're not talking about naturally just Ethiopian people. We're talking about people that act like Ethiopians in that they are ignorant of our Father's word. They don't know our Father's promises. They don't study our Father's word. They are today's modern Gentiles. Verse 13. And he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria. You all know the king of Assyria and the type of the king of Assyria, Satan. And will make Nineveh a desolation and dry like a wilderness. Dry of what? Dry of the living water. Verse 14. And flocks shall lie down in the midst of her and the beasts of the nations. Both the Comorant and the bittern shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. In other words, God's going to destroy it all. Verse 15. This is the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly. In other words, the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly. You know what? You've got a type of Babylon in this. The rejoicing city. Oh, everything was good times. We had such freedoms, and we were drunken on our freedoms. That said in their heart, I am, then there is none besides me. In other words, I am the most important thing. It's all about me. It's all about me and my selfies and my posts. 
It's all about the lifestyle I want to live. It's all about my choice to kill my unborn child. It's all about my choice to be a socialist. How is she become a desolation? A place for beasts to lie down in. Everyone that passeth by her shall hiss and wag his hand. In other words, in astonishment. In other words. Let us turn over now to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2. Moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Verse 2. Go and cry in the ears of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, I remember thee, the kindness of thy youth, the love of thine espousals, when thou wentest after me in the wilderness, in a land that was not sown. Verse 3. Israel was holiness unto the Lord, the first fruits of his increase. All that devour him shall offend. Evil shall come upon them, saith the Lord. In other words, anyone that devours Israel shall offend, and evil shall come upon them. Hear ye the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. That's all twelve tribes. Verse 5. Thus saith the Lord, What iniquity have your fathers found in me, that they are gone afar from me, or far from me, and have walked after vanity, and are become vain. Again, homosexuality, bisexuality, transgenderism, pedophilia, secularism, science over God, socialism, communism, Luciferianism, Satanism, seeking after possessions, seeking after power, seeking after wealth, seeking after sexual deviance, all of these things are vanity. In other words, what God is saying here, what iniquity did your fathers find in me? That they are gone far from me. In other words, that they have uh, turned to the side and have walked away after vanity and have become vain. Verse 6, Neither said they, Where is the Lord that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, and led us through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and the shadow of death, through a land no man passed through, and where no man dwelt? In other words, do people seek God, even with all of this? Verse 7, And I brought you into a plentiful country, to eat the fruit thereof, and the goodness thereof. But when ye entered, ye defiled my land, and made my heritage an abomination. Well, Canada, United States of America, Australia, Britain, Europe. Verse 8. The priests said not, Where is the Lord? They that handled the law knew me not. The pastors also transgressed against me, and the prophets prophesied by Baal, and walked after things that do not profit. Again, all the things that I have listed about nine or ten times now do not profit. And that's what men walk after today, waving their little flags and preaching their little socialism. Verse 9. Wherefore, I will yet plead with you, saith the Lord, and with your children's children will I plead. Verse 10. For pass over the isles of Chittim and see, send under Kedar, and consider diligently, and see if there be any such thing. In other words, none of those people changed their gods. None of those Gentiles changed their gods. I mean, they were worshipping false deities and false gods, but they did so in ignorance. Yet they were loyal to them, but the children of Israel, no siree, Bob. Verse 11. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are yet no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which doth not profit. Again, America, Canada, Europe. Verse 12. Be astonished, O ye heavens, at this, and be horribly frayed. Be very desolate saith the Lord. In other words, if that's your choice. Verse 13. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, 
and hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, they forsook the living water, Christ Jesus, our Lord, and God, and have began worshiping things which are broken cisterns that can hold no water. In other words, that cannot hold any living water. They have turned their back on God, in essence, is what he's saying. Verse 14, Is Israel a servant? Is he a home-born slave? Why is he spoiled? Verse 15, The young lions roared upon him and yelled. They made his land waste. His cities are burnt without inhabitant. You know, look at our big cities now. At the trash and the drugs and the murder and the politicians they keep electing. Verse 16, Also the children of Noph and Tephanes have broken the crown of thy head. Why? Because they convinced people to worship their gods. Verse 17, Hast thou not procured this unto thyself, and that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God when he led thee by the way? Verse 18, And now what hast thou to do in the way of Egypt? to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? In other words, why are you drinking the waters of these foul places that did not worship God, but worshiped false gods, and oppressed men, and took them into servitude? You know, our own country is being taken into servitude. You know, Laws are being rewritten. History is being changed. Our freedoms are being removed from us. Christians are becoming second-class citizens. And people are tolerant of it. Oh, it's just the way it is. Verse 19. Thine own wickedness shall correct thee. Thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee. That is to say, there's no fear of God and no reverence for God, saith the Lord of hosts. Verse 20, For of old time I have broken thy yoke. In other words, of old time I freed you, and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, I will not transgress, whereupon every high hill and under every green tree thou wanderest, playing the harlot. In other words, grove worship, and upon the high hills, the high hills were the places of worship. You can consider those as churches today, and you could even say the Capitol building, the White House, the, uh, the, the House of Congress, the Senate. Verse 21, Yet I planted thee a noble vine, holy a right seed, how then art thou turned to degenerate to a to the degenerate plant of a strange vine unto me? In other words, God's own people have become a strange vine unto him. They've become unrecognizable to him because they have sought after the gods of this world, again, as mentioned before. Verse 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before thee, saith the Lord. In other words, you, you, your soap and your nitre can't remove it from you. Verse 23. How canst thou say, I am not polluted? I have not gone after Balaam. See thy way in the valley. Know what thou hast done. Thou art a swift dromedary transversing her ways. In other words, you're like a swift camel running from place to place drinking up any water you can find rather than being in the good holy land that God gave you where the living waters flowed freely. Verse 24. A wild ass used to the wilderness that snuffeth up the wind at her pleasure. In her occasion, who can turn her away? All they that seek her will not weary themselves. In her month they shall find her. In other words, they're going to chase after the same thing she chased after. She snuffs at the wind. In other words, it's a bunch of hot air. It amounts to nothing. It's vanity. Verse 25. Withhold thy foot from being a shod, and thy throat from thirst. But thou saidest, There is no hope. No, for I have loved strangers. After them I will go. 
In other words, strangers, of course, being the other people which God said to refrain from and not to worship their gods. You know, we have strangers in this country. Some of them are our own senators, congressmen, representatives, governors. And they obey not the laws of the United States nor the Constitution. But do readily as they will to pander so that they may gain in power. Verse 26. As the thief is ashamed when he is found, in other words, he's not ashamed unless he's caught, so is the house of Israel ashamed. They, their kings and their princes and their priests and their prophets. In other words, all of them, from the holiest to the, to, to the common man. Verse 27. Saying to a stock, we're talking about a stock of wood here, stock, stock of wood, thou art my father, and to a stone thou hast brought me forth. For they have turned their back unto me, and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they will say, Arise and save us. Yeah, old oh brother. When people are in trouble, they will call upon the name of the Lord. But any other time, they will worship the stock, which is, these are false gods is what this amounts to. The stock and the stone are things that man hew, hewed out and covered over with metal and fell in worship to and said, You are my God. And again, Anything that you put before God, that you put in place of God, becomes your God. Again, all the aforementioned things. Verse 28. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise, if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. Wherefore will you plead with me? In other words, why are you calling upon me? Ye all have transgressed against me, saith the Lord. Verse 30. In vain I have smitten your children. They received no correction. Your own sword hath devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. And you could take the word sword there and drop the S off of it and make it word and, and the connotation will hold. Your own words have devoured your prophets like a destroying lion. Verse 31. O generation, see the word of the Lord. Have I been a wilderness unto Israel, a land of darkness? Wherefore my people say, We are lords. We will come no more unto thee. In other words, people raising themselves up the same way that Satan did. Verse 32. Can a maid forget her ornaments or a bride her attire? Yet my people have forgotten me days without number. Verse 33. Why trimmest thou thy way to seek love? Therefore thou hast also taught the wicked ones thy ways. In other words, why trimming is like trimming the wick of a, of a candle. In other words, why have you cut down the way to seek love? In other words, instead of seeking love honestly, they seek the hire of a harlot. And thou hast also taught the wicked ones thy ways. In other words, those in their sin. You've made them even worse sinners. Verse 34. Also in thy skirts is found the blood of the souls of the poor innocents. I have not found it by secret search, but upon all these. In other words, God didn't even have to look secretly. It was displayed out there. They're not hiding their agenda anymore. Verse 35. Yet thou sayest, because I am innocent, surely his anger will turn for me. Behold, I will plead with thee, because thou sayest, I have not sinned. Verse 36. Uh, uh, you know, find a sinner that admits he's a sinner, and you found a good man. But all of these say, we have not sinned. In homosexuality, we have not sinned. In lesbianism, we have not sinned. In transgenderism, we have not sinned. In pedophilia, we have not sinned. No, we're just exploring diversity. In socialism, we have not sinned. In casting away God, we have not sinned. In our false religions and in our false doctrines, we have not sinned. We're just looking at the broader picture. Verse 36. Why gaddest thou about so much to change thy way? In other words, why are you wasting your time to change thy way? 
Thou also shalt be ashamed of Egypt, as thou was ashamed of Assyria. In other words, these people are running after the gods of Egypt. They're running after the gods of Assyria. They went to Egypt for help when God was their savior. They went to Assyria for help when God was their savior. And both Pharaoh and both the king of Assyria are types of the Antichrist. And people are going to run and fall and worship the Antichrist rather than God because they don't know the truth because they haven't learned it. Because they've turned their backs on God and walked out of the way. Verse 37. Yet thou shalt go forth from him and thine hands upon thine head. For the Lord hath rejected thy confidence and thou shalt not prosper in them. In other words, you're going to go forth from the king of Assyria and from the king of the Egyptians because he cannot help you. All of his promises are in vain. Just as Satan promises to Eve were in vain and, and by extension Adam. And just as politicians today promise, promise, promise bigger and better and freer and yet all of their things are not going to prosper. They're not going to prosper in socialism. They're not going to prosper in perverseness. They're not going to prosper in possessions. They're not going to prosper in power. Oh, they will in this earth age, as they serve their flesh and by extension Satan, and as they fall to him and worship him, because they're too preoccupied with the flesh to worry about the truth of God's word and to learn it and to know it so that they can study our Father's word and understand it. At any rate, that's where I'm going to end this Bible study. Let me remind you, brothers and sisters, to stay in our Father's word every day. If you can't, certainly study every week. Study weekly in our Father's word. Keep yourself familiar with our Father's word. Use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word, the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the E.W. Bulliger Companion Bible, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, and of course the good old King James Bible. But first and foremost, before you study our Father's Word, ask our Father for guidance and wisdom and understanding so that you may understand these things and not be as these who worship after the flesh and worship the gods of this world. And brothers and sisters, always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness because God knows they are the ones that need it the most. Until we see you next time, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.